Hello, welcome everyone to our session. Good morning. How you guys are doing? Any regrets? Awesome. Any regrets so far after coming to Vegas? No? Yes? Cool. So I'm sure you know this session is not going to make you regret. So we are going to talk about um, five ways that uh, application uh, insight can impact any cloud migration and cloud adoption. Uh, myself is Subarno Mukherjee. I work with App Dynamics. I'm a solution architect, and I work specifically with AWS as our partner. So in next one and uh, in next 60 minutes, we will we will see. Uh, five areas that we are seeing how our customers are leveraging APM and AppDynamics to uh, you know, accelerate their cloud migration project, and also how they are leveraging our capabilities to natively monitor applications that are running on um, AWS. So let's uh, move ahead. So this is the legal disclaimer that I'm supposed to show you. I expect you guys are all very fast reader. So I'll leave it there for five seconds and expect you guys to read it all. Done? So let me start with a little story here. Um, so last week, and it is a true story, by the way. So last week, uh, me and my wife, we were shopping for her car. Um, we were test driving uh, Acura RDX. It's a nice car, drives well. My wife liked it. The drive was smooth. It was calm and quiet. She, she liked the handling and everything. And um, she was trying the other controls, like navigation, the Apple AirPlay, and stuff like that. And she was trying to navigate something. And she said, I hate it. I don't know how to work with this navigation. I love my Google map. So what does that tell us? You know, a product? like RDX, which is a phenomenal product, this, all the enterprise companies like you, that like we are dealing with, they are very good at making their products phenomenal. Whatever they do, making cards, selling banking products, selling insurance. But customers are expecting you know, a very upscale experience as they inter interface with this application or the products. So that's the challenge. You know, how you guys can create applications which are upscale, which provides a very seamless, seamless and frictionless experience to your end customers, so they do not leave your brand, your application. So I would like to quickly go through some of the data that uh, we sourced from our, our research partners. And like 61%, are using mobile phones to carry out banking activity. I think everybody, every one of us has experienced that. And three of 10 is going to switch if the app does not meet the expectation. It does not matter how good or bad the bank is, but it is the app, it is the experience, that's the conduit you know, between the brand and the customer that makes the switch happen. 15% of the retail sales projected comes to e-commerce. Thanks to Amazon, they showed the way, and now it has become a mainstream trend. If you are not online, you are not in business. So with all that, I think, I think it's becoming you know, so eminent that our customers, they expect the experience like Facebook, Google, Amazon, no matter what you guys sell. But that's the experience that they demand, and, ex and very upscale, personalized, intimate experience with your brand. And your application is more becoming face of your brand. So what we are going to you know, uh, discuss in next is how this can make happen with a cloud adoption, right? So we are adopting cloud to, to overcome these challenges that our customers are facing. So we are trying to see how best we can adopt with our you know, ever demanding customers and you know, provide them a very seamless experience as they use our product and our brand. So we do see, you know, this is like a four phase of cloud adoption journey, which is, I'm sure, you know, a lot of you can identify yourself in one of these phases. It's, it's not, a, it's very common um, linguistics. 
So with traditionalists, what we do see is you know, our customers who are trying to move their application to the cloud. There are some applications which might still remain in the data center, maybe for some compliance reason, or they, they require very specialized compute that, that may not be there in the cloud yet. The next one is pragmatist, and that's where you know, customers try to migrate their application. It's not really adopting uh, the cloud-native trend or culture. It's more like how I can guess, get you know, best bang for my bucks. So I have web logic, I have some Oracle database running behind my firewall. How fast and easily I can move them onto AWS, at least to rip off some of the infrastructure benefits that I can get by you know, retiring or at least releasing some of my data center efforts and resources. That's very common. That's typically what we call as you know, the cloud migration phases where customer typically take their workload and move off. Um, the next one is a transformationist where uh, the customers, they try to adopt more and more cloud native architecture and, and they start adopting microservices, serverless, and those things. So this is, this is more like an optimized phase where, where we do see customers are adopting a lot more net new services which are being innovated and offered by, by AWS. And at the same time, if you, if you look at as, as this shift from left to right, they significantly increase the frequency of the software release that they do. And that's the goal. We want to make sure we release our features much quicker so our application remain relevant, so, as, so does our brand. So what, what that, you know, uh, what is the challenge to IT? So we get it, we want to move fast, we want to get more features to our customer faster, we want to keep our brand relevant. So with that, I think what we all experience is, is our application is becoming more distributed than ever. I used to have one web logic running my one monolith application. Now it has been split into 200 microservice applications, man, and that's been supported by five different databases, correct? And I need to make sure everything is connected. I stay on top of those. More dependencies, faster cycles. We are chasing behind our DevOps teams. We are trying to inculcate a very fascinating DevOps culture to make sure we are aligned with the, with the release of our applications. The last one is the dynamic which is like the advent of technologies like serverless Lambda, which creates a new kid in the block. It's not really new, but still, if I look at our application portfolio, uh, an introduction of Lambda is something is very transient in nature. So it's, it's a component which can exist for a, for a while, and it can drive two million transactions per, per hour, then all of a sudden it vanishes. So how do we make sure you know, all the challenges that we are seeing as we adopt cloud native and we address them so that as an IT fraternity, we make sure we are staying, staying on top and at the same time we address these challenges as we adopt the cloud adoption journey, right? So that's our first best practice that how we can address these issues and make sure we are on track on our cloud adoption journey. Having an end-to-end -end visibility. I think everybody would agree that if I have 10,000 or thousands of containers running and they're interacting with each other to, to perform a certain business function, we need to know how the interaction is going on. We need to understand at a high level how everything is related, right? So that's what we define by horizontal visibility. Like, it's a 30,000 feet view which gives me a very comprehensive understanding of my application portfolio it could be on premise if you are a, 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 you know still on uh, you, if you have applications running behind your data center it can be a hybrid it can be a release which has been a canary release or a blue green deployment where you have some of the part of your application running in your data center and some of the part of the application is running on aws so we can make sure you can visualize everything you know like like the way it's happening the next one is the in depth visibility so as we have the high level view of my application and how they are you know, related with each other, it's necessary that how quickly from that view I transition into a level of code to find out if there is any performance degradation, degradation which is happening, right? So this is the in-depth visibility that lets you to identify isolate application from the high level view and then come down quickly at the line of code to identify 
why exactly a hotspot has happened, why there is a page load which is not happening the way it should be. And that's what, and that maybe that experience is causing your, your customer to leave your web page, right? So that's in-depth visibility and how quickly we can transition from a high level 30,000 feet view into a code level diagnosis. Use cases, visibility across canary releases. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, um, how many of you are, are actually done you know, canary releases where you guys are having some workload which is running on AWS, but still some users are being you know, redirected into on-premise as well. So I'm, I'm sure um, that you guys must have seen, so now you have workload which is, which is split out across cloud and on-premise. Correct. So, how you make sure you see the entire entirety? So that's a use case where uh, where we find it uh, uh, relevant. Next is the cloud migration. So that's another uh, key use case. Uh, the way we help cloud migration is to understand all the dependencies for the application that you guys are moving. So to make sure, if you miss a critical dependency and you leave it behind as you move your application, it might cause you know. Uh, a delay when, when you do the testing, you find something has left behind, and then you have to come back again, you know, you know, change your project plan and, and so on and so forth. So, but if you have the visibility right before you start the migration and plan it nicely, create your move groups the way it should be, you can save your save the time that actually takes to migrate your workload. The next one is more for optimized customers who are really adopting cloud native architecture like. Uh, tracing Lambda flows. We know Lambdas are very transient in nature, and that's why it's a black box. It happens, then it disappears, right? So how do we make sure when it's happening, we can trace it end to end? It has been a challenge up till now. But with, with, with AppDynamics and the flow map that we have, you can now actually monitor a Lambda end to end. The next one being Kubernetes Docker visibility. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the audience, we, we should have a bigger audience here who has been f exposed to Docker or, or Kubernetes uh, style of deployment. And the challenge that our customers must have been seen is, it's not the application. It is the application running inside the container, but how we make sure the container itself is visible to us. The, the resource that is being consumed by the, consume, the, uh, uh, the container or the Kubernetes is you know, they know, that they know the application, but the way they orchestrate all the resources, we know all the metrics that have been generated by Kubernetes, so we understand you know, what exactly is going on at the container level. Or even if, if, if it has been hosted to another layer, we should have a visibility to that as well. So the next, um, we are going to have a little demo uh, to explain um, the visibility which I, which I just spoke about. Okay. So this is what we call a, a flow map, okay? So, you know, we, we ha I have created, you know, one application ecosystem which is called AD Financial. So this is, this is a, a stock trading application where customer can log in, they can research their stock, they can request for a quote, and if they like it, they can, you know, move ahead and actually process a trade. And it has, you know, several components, as, as you could see. We have an order processing node, we have a code service, we have an account management, we have a web front end that is used by customers to, to actually interact with the product. So with that, um, the way we create this flow map is we have very lightweight agents which need to be instrumented along with the application. It can be a VM-based application, it can be installed on a physical, it can be EC2, it can run on containers, it can be a Lambda application, it can be anything. And we can, as we instrument these applications, so we use a tag and follow mechanism. So every transaction, every, each and every transaction which is being processed by any of these applications, we tag and follow them, and that's how we create this flow map for you. So what does this, this tell you? This is your 30,000 feet view of all the applications that are part of this specific application portfolio which is processing your loan. Right? Now, 
let's take an example. You know, since uh, uh, we, are, we are talking about cloud migration here, so I'll, I'll talk about cloud migration a little bit, and I'll show you how this feature is going to help you uh, to make a move into the cloud. But also, I'll, I'll share you know, some of the cloud adoption use cases as well as we, as we follow through. So with that, let's let's take an uh, you know hypothetical situation where you know you know I'm I'm you know I'm the owner of this application AD Financial and I need to move this application into in, into AWS. So this is a typical lift and shift use case. Now if I take a look at this view, which is a thirty thousand feet view, I do see you know different components and some of the components are having issues like order processing, the code service, and 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 I think few other like account management. So in any cloud migration project, the biggest challenge is how quickly I can establish my ROI, right? And as we start the cloud migration project, I don't think we want to do a big bang. Rather, we want to pick, cherry pick a few application components, do a maybe a canary release, and see how it is you know, really going on, show the value to the business, and then actually do the big bang, right? So if I take a look, you know, my order processing, is the most critical component of my application, which is having an issue. I can see that. Now, if I drill down to find out more, I do see that order processing is very slow. 30%, almost 35% of all my transactions are slow or very slow. Only 60% are running fine, which is not good for, you know, for being a very critical application here. So this gives me a good understanding that this might be a cherry pick, a good candidate to cherry pick and you know, lift to the cloud and see how we can improve the performance as we, as we run in the cloud. Now let me try and understand why you know, my, app, my transactions are slow. As I click into the, the slow moving transaction, I'm presented with all the user journeys which are experiencing a performance degradation. Now how how does the product know that 35% is slow? This is red versus green. So the way we do it, you know, we have a unique capability called dynamic baselining. So with dynamic baselining, you can pretty much take any metrics and create a baseline out of it. For example, if it is a response time, and maybe you want that for a process trade transaction, your baseline should be two, two seconds or two milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. So that's your baseline. So is it a static baseline? No, it is not a static baseline. It can be a dynamic baseline. Every business transaction can have a different baseline or even the same transaction can have different baselines based on the time when it is happening. For example, your business may experience more workload during between three to five on a Friday. And it may have a different workload on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. So all those things we can we configure as we define the baseline. So it is a completely dynamic based on the way your transaction interacts with your customer. So it is not static at all. Now with that, as we set that up, what, what, what the next thing you can do with the product is anything that you know, deviates from the baseline is not normal. It's very simple, right? Anything that's under the baseline is green. Anything that goes beyond the baseline is red. Sometimes you may see yellow as well when it, you know, kind of reaches to the threshold. So with that, that's how we created this, you know, bucket where, you know, you can really focus. You don't have to look into all other, all other you know, areas which does not have an issue. So if I double click, on one of this, I am taken into a, a very code level detail. So this is a typical you know, you know, stack trace that take me to the line of the code, and I can see that a specific JDBC call is taking so much time. And this tells me that you know, there is a problem with the resource waiting. So my, my Method is waiting for a database resource to get freed. That's why it's taking so much time. So this, again, gives me an understanding that this might be a resource problem and a scalability problem. And if I move this application into, into AWS, we might be able to solve it, right? So if I go back to my uh, flow map, what do I see here? Again, um, all the dependencies. And now I know it makes sense to move order processing 
into AWS. At the same time, I need to understand what else I need to move along with it, right? So now it is the time for me to create the move group. So if I look at it, web front end, code service, and, um, and the database, these are all related uh, pretty well with order processing service. So maybe it makes sense to move them all as part of one move group. So this is how you know the visibility, both uh, horizontal and in depth, can help us to understand what the issues are, and it can help us determine whether or not it is the right candidate to move into the cloud. Now let me uh, get back to my presentation, and let's see the second best practice. So as we know the move groups, uh, we need to understand uh, how these applications are consuming resource. Because as we move into the cloud, I might need to know whether or not I should pick an EC2 large or I should need a you know, X4 large. So how do I do that? So there are some use cases like uh, right-sizing cloud migration, then idle resource isolation. This is more of a cloud native use case where you are running maybe thousands of EC2 instances on, on AWS and you need, to know, you need to know how many of them are idle to make sure you are you know, cutting your cost down. The third use case is monitoring AWS Lambda free tier. A lot of customers, they want for some projects, they just want to remain under the free tier, which is, I guess, one million transaction per month. So we can monitor that for you guys and let you know when you guys are really coming close to that threshold. And of course, monitoring AWS spend. A quick demo. Now the same, um, I'll come back to the same um, example where we can see uh, this is now a different view of the same application. The same application we were, we were looking at a flow map. So this gives you a very physical or infrastructure level metrics like what, what, you know, how many nodes, like the account management application has three nodes. It is running on a you know, like 64-bit JDK server. If I click onto you know, this each individual, I can see the memory, if the server metrics, and all this information, right? So this will help me to understand like the, the move group that I am moving onto AWS, what is their typical resource consumption, how the topology is being deployed, so I can, I can create, I can, I can, um, I can, uh, I can create my uh, resource model for AWS as well. So let me go back to the presentation again. So this is going to be the third area. That as we, as we make a move, so I planned my migration. We have moved the move group into, into AWS. Now the next is, how do I prove that the migration is a success? It's actually working for me. So that's, that's the next thing is all about, that how we make a validate that uh, my workload before and after migration. It is a side-by-side -side comparison. How can I do that? So AppDynamics provide us a way to accomplish that. I can have a technical comparison. I can create like a dashboard to compare a pre and post migration release, uh, like whether or not the throughput has been improved or not, whether or not this utilization has gone better. But the more importantly, we can also measure how the business has impacted, right? No matter what the where the application is running, we need to make sure that the business stays as usual, right? Or at least it should get better as, I, as we move into the cloud. So we have a unique capability called BizIQ, which can trace all the parameters that your application is exchanging with each other. Any parameter that you pass through as an argument to your functions, we can track those. Now if it is an PII kind of information, there is a configuration that we can use to mask it so the, so the agents will not pick it up. Other than that, if it is in any business critical data right at order, the amount of order or the number of users who are logging in, the number of sessions that you want to track, we can track all those business parameters. More to it, what we can do, we can correlate this business metrics with the application performance and let you know that there is a flaw in the web page and that's why you are losing 20 customer every minute. People are not actually going to check out page because of an issue in the add to cart.
functionality. So we can really correlate the business experience with the technical flaws and give you a very crisp leading indicator where to look for the issue and quickly resolve that. The same feature BizIQ we can use to do a release validation. So we can instrument the applications in a way that we can compare your application before and after migration. Uh, so the third dimension of validation is the ex user experience, right? So no matter where the application is running, it's being interacted by the user. The user can be spread across many geographies. They, they might be using different devices, laptops, uh, you know, different versions of OS. So we can also, you know, measure how the user experience is as they interact with the, with, with the application. And the same way we can get a scorecard like before and after migration. So the validation is done like, it's like a 360 degree migration, uh, uh, validation from technology perspective, from business data perspective, and from the user experience perspective. So we do not leave any stone unturned. So I'll quickly go to a demo. <clears throat> so this one is our you know, cloud migration comparison, before and after for the AD Financial app. So if, you, if we look at this one, at the top we are, we are collecting some of the business metrics, like pre-trade volume, percentage of users who are trading it, the performance, right? At the same time, if you look at, on the right-hand side, we are comparing some of the technical metrics, like response time, on-premise versus cloud, right? So we can clearly see that on-premise, we had those funny peaks when we are experiencing the load, correct? So this was pretty much in line with our analysis that as we see more demand, we saw a resource constraint. Now, since the workload has been moved onto AWS, that is non-existent, correct? We are seeing more often, you know, um, nicer pattern here. So this is about technical validation. Now, I would like to, to have your attention in this area, which is the conversion rate. Now, if you remember, this application was pretty simple application. Customer are logging in, then uh, coming to account home, then researching stock, getting a quote, then processing the trade. So what we have done here is the way we have instrumented the application, we can measure how the customers are falling off at every page. So this is a typical conversion funnel that most of the banking e-commerce customers do care about. For example, if I'm launching a campaign, I want to make sure how the campaign has been worked out or not, right? So this helps a lot to manage those type of things. Now we could see that after migration, the conversion rate has gone up. So if you could see, there is a significant improvement in the get quote web page and the process trade web page. These two application we moved onto AWS and these two applications were having you know, most number of issues, right? So from 16%, um, it has gone down to 5.6%. So this is a way that we can prove that it's not only, a, the migration is not only a technical success, but also actually it has improved the way we are doing our business, right? So another, thing that I would like to show you, I mean, since um, it has been um, moved onto AWS and it, we, we are actually having a canary release, so this is how the new application looks like. Um, let me make sure you guys see it. So our old AD financial application, this is still running on-premise, it is a canary release. We have now some components like order processing, code service, and some of the database moved on to AWS. Not only that, we got rid of the Oracle DB and we, are, we have adopted DynamoDB. So, so if you could see, you know, we are giving you a complete picture of a hybrid release where some component is running on-premise and some component is running in the cloud in AWS. And you can quickly, you know, if I go to AD Financial, this is my on-premise. 
AD Financial Cloud, this is my cloud counterpart. So how easily you can comprehend both the world, right? So let me go back to my next tips. So these were some of the use cases. Uh, validating cloud migration, which we have seen already. Release validation, this is more uh, useful for uh, cloud native workloads. So if you have like a microservice which is getting released very frequently, you want to make sure before you have the release uh, running on the production, you need to certify that. So the same concept, the way we certify a migration, the same way we can make sure a microservice-based release is also certified. Track business outcomes, so that what we spoke about, like how we can use BizIQ and track your business parameters, and to make sure we can lead, lead your business to, so everybody understand that how the application performance is impacting your business. So I did the demo a little earlier. So the fourth one is avoiding the silo tools. So with that, I'm sure, you know, now, since we are moving onto cloud, some of our components are still hosted behind our data centers. We do see this problem. So we have application monitoring, right? So we have still Node.js, Java, .NET, multiple applications which are, which are being implemented using many different technologies. And how do we make sure those applications are performant? Containers, how do we ensure we gather all the metrics that is being spit out by our container deployment technologies. Database, Kubernetes, infrastructure nodes, lambdas, then CloudWatch, X-Ray. So we are, we are like bombarded with so many things that now are being siloed and we need to take care of those. So what should we really do? You know, how can we have a single ring to rule all? How can we create a Uber experience for you guys so that you can have one platform to monitor everything. You can get rid of this war room type situation where somebody is looking at the log, somebody is looking at the cloud watch, x-ray. There is a one team which is responsible for APM, the traditional APM. There is another team sitting on the database side and they're responsible for, you know, if any database query is taking too much time. How we can bridge the gap and make the triage of any performance issue simplified. So that's what we mean by a full stack visibility. How we can ensure that we can bring everything together, bundle them in one platform, so we have everything that we need from one product. We don't have to hop around multiple user interfaces which are not correlated and struggle to find out a triage. Now, this is a heavily loaded slide. Um, my apology for that. Um, but let me try to explain this, what I'm trying to say. So we have, uh, if you look at the box on the right-hand side, which is a little purple. So we have all the application, all the services like EC2, Beanstalk, ECS, EKS, RDS, S3. I'm sure these are very familiar to you all and you guys use extent, extensively these services to run your applications. So these are the services where we run our Java, Node.js, Python, all the applications, correct? So these are the key APM candidates, right? So this is where our code lives, our applications lives. We need to make sure we instrument them. Now, AppDynamics has a native capability to support the full APM function for any workload which may be running in these services. So we extend complete APM support for these services which you can use to run your workloads. You can have end user management, you can have application agents to monitor Node.js, Python, Java application. You can have our Kubernetes agent to monitor an EKS cluster or an ECS cluster. We can use database agent to monitor any RDS or even Aurora DB. Now, we also understand that beyond just the application, CloudWatch gathers you know, a wealth of information about these services more from an infrastructure perspective. 
So we do have also integration with CloudWatch, and we can grab all the CloudWatch metrics and you know, have it presented for you in the, in, the, in the same context. So how many of you are using CloudWatch extensively? A lot? OK. Um, so it's a great tool, wealth of information, but I think a lot of our customers, um, they also try to aggregate the CloudWatch data, and that's where um, AppDynamics can, can complement very nicely with, with, uh, with, with CloudWatch to grab all these metrics and create a comprehensive dashboard so that you can get an actionable insight quickly. Now the box on the, on the other side, on, on green, so these are typically um, non-APM candidate, like you know, Route 53 or auto scaling. These are more like a first class services where you don't run your application or run your code. These are more used as part of your application, correct? So we, do have, those are, we don't have APM support for those because they are not APM candidate. But we do have extensions, CloudWatch extension. So any CloudWatch data that, that you would like to gather about those services, we can make them available as well. The same applies for Amazon X-Ray. So any traces, any traces that is being captured by X-Ray, we can get it imported as well in real time into our platform. So with that, I think, let me summarize. We talked about core APM capability, CloudWatch integration, and X-ray integration. And all the metrics that we are, we are getting, all the goodies, are being reported onto the controller. So the controller is what I have been demoing this far. So the nice dashboards, that's the controller. All the metrics that we gather are eventually reported in the controller. That's where we get all the out-of-the-box dashboarding capabilities, like flow maps and all. So for the controller perspective, there are a few ways that you can procure the controller. It can be a SaaS-based controller. And we offer our SaaS-based controller in, in multiple AWS regions. Also, if, if you guys want to have the controller installed behind your VPC, that's also an option. We have a cloud formation template that can be used to make the uh, installation simplified. So with that, I think the use cases are, as I said, the typical APM use case, application monitoring, then business performance, end user monitoring, infrastructure monitoring, and CloudWatch in integration. So, the full stack monitoring of your IT, of your application, of your business performance, CloudWatch, everything comes under one platform, making your life more simplified, making your different teams to collaborate with each other at ease. And that's how we can reduce war rooms, you know, reduce MTTR, get to the root cause much faster than later. <clears throat> So we would do a little show time here. So we have seen the APM piece of it already. So the core functionalities of APM and infrastructure, I think I have covered in my previous demos. So what we will do now, show you a little glimpse of our cloud watch capability. Like this is a dashboard that we have created for for, for, <clears throat> for this demo where we can track all the different AWS services that we are using. This is the high level dashboard. This can, one of our customers are, um, you know, uh, they, they really, uh, they, I came across a few use cases where they really want to have a, from an operations perspective, they want to have a very high level view to understand what's going on across multiple regions, multiple accounts many services, so this kind of dashboard really helped them to comprehend everything in, in one page. And as, as we want, we can really you know, go down, for example, if I need to understand how my EC2s are doing, I can simply click into it, and um, and get, uh, is it clear enough? Yeah. And, and really get a, a, more, a little more close uh, understanding of like my EC2 instances, you know, how they're running, how they're distributed. And also I can you know, get a little more de detail about all the different EC2s that I am running. There's one widget I'd like to have your attention is the, this one, which shows 
idle EC2 instances. So this is again a nice example of dynamic baselining. Um, so a lot of customers, I have one customer who has 1,000 EC2 accounts running, I mean 1,000 EC2 instances running across hundreds of EC2 accounts across multiple regions, and they are really finding it hard to identify the idle instances. Lot, and a lot of times, you know, people spin up the instances and then they just forget to shut up, shut down, and it keeps running. So those type of use cases are, are we can really address where for this example, we have created a baseline like if any EC2 instance where the CPU utilization is less than 2%, we will mark it as idle. Now, it, it doesn't have to be only CPU. It can be a memory. It can be based on IOPS. It can be a metric that is relevant to your business. Right? So this is how we can you know, um, have more comprehensive view around AWS um, you know, different services, and we can drill down. Um, I'd like to show you also the, our Lambda dashboard, which, um, which is tracking the CloudWatch data for the Lambda functions. Uh, it, it, we are doing here um, the aggregation. Also, at the top, the top widget, um, you can see where it, has, it is aggregating all the Lambda functions which are running in this account. And also, we are tracking all the individual Lambda functions like add payment, add shipping, credit check. And, you know, showing with the very basic um, lambda metrics. So these are like you know some of the capabilities with respect to uh, CloudWatch integration, and I, I think with with that, um, it's fair enough for me to say that uh, it is a comprehensive platform that can help you to take care of your APM need, CloudWatch integration, infrastructure, end user monitoring, and also tie them all together and create a um, you know comprehensive business metrics as well out of this. <clears throat> so now we are here, I think, uh, the last, but not the least, um, best practice, which is ensuring that the monitoring approach that we adopted is actually forward-looking. It is the most important thing, right? So how do we make sure that the monitoring tool, the vendor that you picked, they are invested in the right direction. They are investing in the way that your enterprise want to envision their IT trend going to be. So the way AppDynamics has been maturing over the last couple of years, we have spent a lot of time for our developers to create you know, first class support for Docker. Then we have extended the same first class support for Kubernetes. So now, it is, it's, a, it's available that we can have a complete end-to-end -end Kubernetes support uh, on AWS. Um, if, you, if you plan to use you know, EKS to spin up your, your you know, Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster, we can get you a very comprehensive visibility about the containers. You know, the way Kubernetes creates you know, different metrics, we can gather them and we can make sure we present them as, as real time. So any pod, we have a visibility at the pod level, at the, cu at the cluster level, and <clears throat> we can tag them uh, with respect to our complete container metrics. And the same capability we have for Docker as well. Tagged metrics, I'm sure this is, this is very common in the Kubernetes or even in, in general AWS resource management where we like to create our own metrics and tag it with services and resources and then we want to filter them, we want to search them to slice and dice you know, more information about the resources. So we have out of the box support for tagged metrics which we can use to create dashboard, to create health rules and to create metrics that might be relevant for you. The same thing. The next one is being uh, support for serverless, AWS Lambda. How, how many of you are, are using Lambda or have been exposed to Lambda? Okay. I, I think, you know, it's, it's a great technology that has been emerged, and, but the challenge remains the same. It's a black box. We don't know what really happens when it interacts with other Lambda functions or it interacts with other application uh, components then we lose the visibility. There is no way we can trace it because it is transient in nature. So that's why we have released um, 
uh, our Lambda capability to monitor uh, the Lambda functions end to end. So with that, we should be able to present you flow maps very much like our core APM, other, you know, core APM support for any other products. The way we instrument Node.js, Java. So it is a very similar way now you can trace and flow the Lambda function and see how, the how, how every transaction has been taken, taken place. <clears throat> um, we can also drill down into the Lambda function to understand if there is any hotspot. And uh, I think uh, we also have our, our CloudWatch integration to ingest any CloudWatch metrics that has been captured for, for the Lambdas, which I showed as part of my last demo. Now, this is you know, all about like today's session here. But it does not end here. So let me summarize what we have discussed so far. There are five ways that we can make you guys successfully adopt and migrate into cloud. And that, that, you know, that takes into consideration having a good visibility across your application, having understanding of how the resources are being utilized, then having an understanding of how we can break the silos and make sure we have different capabilities part of one platform that is a single platform tool to help your all the monitoring needs. And the next one was business, how we can tie the business metrics back to the application performance so we understand how the application performance is impacting my business outcome. And the last one is how, how really forward thinking the product is. What is the vision of the product? Is it in the right direction your, in your enterprise is? So with that, I would like to conclude my session. And um, we are having like great sessions and demos, deep dives going on in our booth um, at the expo. So we have a detailed demo of how we can instrument and monitor Lambda functions. We have a demo around um, you know, instrumenting IoT devices. Then a DevOps demo where we instrumented EKS applications and how uh, we can showcase how we can show all the Kubernetes metrics. And of course, the cloud migration demo. And we have another demo which is not listed here, which is um, AI ML demo. So we have that function also coming up with our product. So if you guys are interested to learn more about our capability uh, to, to understand how we are coming up with our AI ML strategy, please do see us in our booth to have more you know, detailed discussion, conversation, and having a you know, comprehensive understanding of our product. Do come see us, and I'm sure if you see us, you won't regret. If you don't see us, you may regret. So hope to see you guys on the floor. We have uh, you know, great sessions and great goodies also that you guys can take with you along with the knowledge. Thank you for joining me. If you guys have any questions, let me know. <laughs>